Welcome back to The Stateless Man. This is Fergus Hodgson broadcasting live from Raleigh, North Carolina. The show is sponsored by AMTG Solutions. That's amtgs.com uh, for all your digital media and web development services. They do uh, great uh, new websites and uh, website redevelopment. So, uh, and I'm pleased to have yeah, Rachel Mills alongside me. Hello. Right. So, um, and Rachel was the one who can take credit for arranging the Ron Paul interview this, this episode, which was a real pleasure. It was my pleasure. Right, yeah. So, And Rachel's own website is uh, rachelmills.com. She does the Full Frontal Liberty podcast, which is kind of like a, a work in progress. But It is It is an evolving project, um, but I'm having a lot of fun with it. Right, and, and I, I've recommended her episode number four, which was about uh, her interview with Obama, which is... Yep, I, I had to pull in a lot of favors from my time in Washington, D.C. It is, it is a work of art in terms of editing, I will wink, say as wink. well. <laughs> but, um, and uh, not related, I had just recently discovered sound effects and how to edit those into my podcast. That, that sure. is in, in no way related to my interview with Obama. Yeah, we're going to have to play a clip, a clip to the, that, of that on the show sometime. <laughs> but one of the uh, sort of best friends of this show and website – uh, he is on the line with us right now. His name is Yael, Yael Asovsky. He lives in Vienna, Austria, and he's originally from Quebec, but he, he's another fellow stateless man, you could say. He uh, spent a lot of his life here in, the, in North Carolina, and he's been an investigative reporter, podcaster. His own podcast is Liberty in Exile, libertyinexile.com, and he's written a couple, a couple of articles for the stateless man recently. Uh, the most, you could say, like freshest in terms of newsiness is uh, about – the European Students for Liberty Conference, which was not this weekend that we just had, but the one before. And he, he wrote, yeah, I'm going to post this one as well. The title is European Students for Liberty Promise New Generation of Freedom. And this is why I get excited about Students for Liberty, because if you go to their events, it just gives you a wonderful optimism that there is this new generation of people who are informed, they understand economics, they understand they can take care of themselves, they're proud. And I'm just so impressed by this. So Yale is one such man, and he's doing great work. I mean, um, he's he's taking the initiative, and he's he's moved to Europe to basically be involved in to, in what's going on in Europe, and to better understand it. He's doing a master's degree, I think, right now. So, I would without I could continue on speaking good things about him, but yeah. So Yale, welcome uh, back to the show. Fergus, thank you very much for the praise, and uh, Rachel, uh, thank you for also having me on there as co-host. Good to have you. Right. So, Yale. Have you been to a European Students for Liberty event before, prior to this one? No, this was actually my first one ever in the history of the world. <laughs> Sorry, uh, first Students for Liberty or just European Students for Liberty? Uh, no, European Students for Liberty. I've been to similar uh, Students for Liberty conferences in Philadelphia, and uh, I believe one down in uh, Florida. There was one in Gainesville. But uh, i got to say, it really is an incredible mashing of, of people from all over the place. So it, was, it was really great to be there. Right, and yet 350 people... Really an impressive amount. I'm amazed because, as I said before, Students for Liberty, as far as I know, they only began in 2008. So what are they, in their sixth year or something like that? And so that's basically, when I was a student and an, under, an undergraduate, they didn't even exist. And this year in the United States, they had like 1,400 or 1,300 people and then 350 in Europe. And I'm, was that more than people expected or what, how, did you, how did people respond to the turnout? How did the leaders respond to that? Well, I guess I believe they expected just from the initial registration maybe over 200, and then it started creeping up in the last few days. But really, at registration, a lot more people showed up. And again, there's a great map that you'll find on the Students for Liberty website and probably on the European Students for Liberty Facebook page. I mean, right. we're talking countries from all over Europe, people from North America, people from Turkey, Russia, I mean, all these different Baltic states, I mean, places you would never even think that liberty lives on. People are interested in these ideas. Yeah, I'm amazed too, just traveling so far. I'm just impressed at the commitment people have. Now, and there's one photo you have of, of the attendees, and it looks like this room is just overflowing with people. So it's just great. Now, how did it live up to or match your expectations. I mean, you've been to these conferences before. How would you say it was distinct from others? Well, with this one, I guess compared to the American Students for Liberty, there was a lot more diversity in that you had different languages being spoken everywhere. 
And uh, right. yes, of course, there were groups speaking French, some speaking German, and I was doing my best to speak to all of them that I could. But in the end, everyone was speaking the same language. It was the same ideas being presented. It was those of whether it be classical liberalism, uh, libertarianism, uh, like just a renewed sense that people can take control of their future and it can be invested in the future of tomorrow. And that's really what these people were all about. Well, you, one, of you, one of the maybe ironic points you make is that the con you describe Europe as the continent which gave birth to liberty. And many people these days would say it's the exact opposite, that it's, a, it's the home of the police and welfare state. How do, you res how do you reconcile that, perhaps not necessarily a contradiction, but you might say a confusion? Well, I mean, the birth of the police and welfare state, again, so we've only had the, these probably for around 200 years, but when you go back to the antique ideas of liberty, we're talking the Roman Empire, we're talking the Magna Carta, we're talking these are really the basic principles that have enshrined I guess the, the founding documents of a lot of the newer countries, such as the United States, and principles that we once thought our governments would uphold forever. But again, it seems as if here on the European continent we do need a, a renewal of such, and I think that's why all these people came together and they were very excited about doing that. Right. Yeah, they must be fed up. <laughs> Well, no, I mean, you, it, the greatest part, I think, was hearing every individual story because there's not one single story as in the United States. It's so many different ones with different leaders, uh, different languages. Everybody's pretty, pretty much facing the same problem of a more collectivist, more statist society, and they're really trying to find a way out of that. And I think these are the types of people that at least people in their own countries are going to want to turn to uh, when everything hits the fan, as it were. What what are the thoughts there about the European Union? Is is that like a, a a main topic of discussion over there? Well, of course, I think I'm probably one of the biggest Euro skeptics, uh, hence why uh, me being at this conference itself was very interesting. But most of the people here realize that it was uh, basically an anti-democratic experiment, and you had a, people from Spain who were talking how terrible it was, people from Greece. And I guess now the people in Cyprus uh, were having their money stolen uh, from the Eurocrats know what it's all about. But I would say on the whole that most people realized that the European project is not one that engenders liberty and is very hostile to the freedoms that are so dear to them. I'm sure it's it's more centralized power rather than less. So yeah. it's, it's always bad. Yeah, we, we are approaching the next break. But I'll just say that yeah, we're speaking with Yale Osowski, and his, his latest article was European Students for Liberty Promise New Generation of Freedom. That is on the statelessman.com. Uh, I'm going to post a link to that to the stateless Facebook page. If you want a question to ask in Yale, particularly about how an expat from the United States moves to a place like Austria and why one would do that, uh, you can call in 1-888-741-7472. Otherwise, uh, stay with us. This is the Stateless Man on the Overseas Radio Network. Sit back and relax. You are tuned into the Overseas Radio Network. This is the Stateless Man pursuing liberty beyond borders, and my it's my pleasure to have Yael Sosky uh, reporting from over in Austria. Now, we're discussing how he, he was saying how the ideas of liberty do seem to flow from uh, European history even if the welfare and warfare states have arisen since that time. And then, then we also mentioned the, the presence of the European Union and what that means. Do you mind sharing a personal, personal note as to why you would, would choose voluntarily to go to live in Europe? I, I think uh, for a lot of people it's sort of been a, a huge inquisitive uh, concern, especially when they hear my accent when I speak to a lot of these people at the conference. I guess framing it correctly, I am someone who is very skeptical of centralized power, You're, and I, I did. It's so it's so, you have such a thick American accent, Yale. <laughs> I know it's terrible. How you speak German, you don't. Yeah, I guess when you speak German, yeah. Okay. No, actually, when I speak German, I'm told I sound like a French man, my first language. <laughs> That's awesome. Right. Yeah, okay. I guess for me, I guess that I have to say that it has to do with what I wanted to do as a journalist. And I was doing a good job in Florida, and I liked doing it, but I wanted to think bigger. And I wanted to attack something that was probably not getting as much attention. And I really don't think there's enough 
scrutiny around the European Union, and I want to do my job. I want to be over here. I want to be able to write the first stories of history, the first pages of history about how the European Union really is choking freedom and choking liberty. Obviously, it helps that I was able to to find a, an educational program to, to help plant me here and a beautiful girlfriend who also uh, invited me along the way. So that's always been very helpful, but that really is the, the end goal for me. Actually, Yale does have a beautiful story in that regard. I'm, work, I'm working. I, I need someone. I would like someone to write an article for The Stateless Man about how to make a long-distance relationship work because I know so many people who are in, inquiring about that, and the success rate seems to be, to be slim, but Yale has pulled it off. So... Well, if it's if it's long distance, it can't be long term. You have to eventually have plans. <laughs> sure, sure. And I guess he's he's made she moved. Yeah, I don't want to give too much of his personal life, but we'll just say he's been successful in that regard. Okay, so I actually will know too that I'm not an expert in the European Union, and that's why I'm glad to have someone like Yale associated with the program. And it's really a, to yeah to have him writing for the site is a privilege. Now, but I he often hear stories coming out of the European Union, such as that. The, I remember the, the Ryan Ear chief executive wanted to go, was invited to come and speak, I guess, to make his case for deregulation of the airlines or something like that to the European Union. And they would, re, they would fund his tickets to get there. And they said they wouldn't, they don't accept discount airlines, that you can't fly to their events on discount airlines. And I just thought that's just so ironic and perhaps indicative of the culture that apparently competition is bad. And, wow. Do you, do you have a comment on that, Yale? Yeah, well, of course. The, well, the European Union in itself, you have to think that it is one centralized supranational institution, but it's housed in two different places. You have the parliament in Strasbourg, France, and then you have a part-time parliament in Brussels, and you have hundreds of people who, are dedica who dedicate their lives daily to writing new laws and regulations without any sort of popular scrutiny. And I will say that there is some sort of this governance ideology that befalls them and makes them think that they really have to, to I don't know, push their agenda of greater centralization, better control, and we know what's best for you. And I think it's the same way in that a lot of people complain about discount airlines because, well, the service isn't as good. But again, like all big bureaucratic institutions, they're not thinking about how it actually does help the people who don't have uh, those many as many euros in their pockets. You don't have to buy from that airline. I mean, that's just the basic response. Like, why do you care that other people are happy to have a discount airline? So no, I, for that, I guess this is just another way of the European Union. Again, the, whenever they're in town, the hotel bills go through the roof. There's a a good story that came out about two years ago. Yeah. The European Commission, of course, when they get together and they're writing laws and regulations, they apparently had a huge hotel party and they spent 200,000 euros <laughs> in one single weekend at a hotel. Oh, okay. It's right. good to be king. <laughs> yeah, that's the – man, it pains me to think about this. But, but, yeah, so but like you say, I mean, well, we could, we could make the same parallels with what goes on here in the United States and in Canada with the crazy pension schemes that the politicians get. There seems to be – you know, extortion going on all over the place. So you've got to kind of pick your poison to some degree, and you're you're seeking to make it work in the EU. And I will say, yeah, I'm I'm very confident that you will be a uh, successful journalist in that realm, and I'm I'm excited to see that advance. Now, at the actual event, though, were there any sort of new insights that you learned, or was it mainly just a networking opportunity? Well, I guess the networking helps, but I think one part. Yeah, we're, we're losing... Um... ...stateless man is a speaker by, by the name of Daniel Model. He's a Swiss okay. fellow, uh, industrialist, and this guy was preaching basically seceding from the state and creating your own paradise. And this is a guy who really has done a great job in doing that. I really point everyone over to the Internet. Look up Daniel Model. Uh, he's also been called uh, the anarchist of Switzerland. He's a very interesting guy, and he gave a great speech there. Cool. Okay. Can I ask a question? You... Sure. Hey. <laughs> Um, so I, I've been reading a lot about uh, Cyprus and and what's happening with their banking system and and the bailouts and the confiscation of depositors' money. Is that in in your um, experience recent there on the ground? Is that causing runs on banks at all? Yeah, how are people continent? responding to that? Yeah. Well, actually, right now there is a huge run on the ATMs, and the uh, central bank did close all the ATMs. There is a banking holiday 
that is now in effect, just like during the Great Depression 1933 in the United States. And for the next two or three days, all banks physically will be closed. All digital access to bank accounts has been completely ceased, so you cannot access your bank account online. You cannot transfer money out of the country through PayPal, Bitcoin, any other way. So people are basically stuck to going to the ATMs if they're open. Of now, which is, there are, are, you talking about, are you talking about Cyprus or are you talking about the continent? No, I'm so, talking about Cyprus, Cyprus on its own. But again, there are a lot of retirees in Cyprus from, from uh, England, uh, from France, and from all over. So this is uh, hitting a lot of people. What an irony. It's your money, except when it's not, basically. <laughs> well, it, I mean, possession is nine-tenths of the law. Isn't that the truth? Basically, yeah. And this is going to give more interest in, yeah, we discussed alternative currencies with Ron Paul earlier, but I'm going to be exploring digital currencies, particularly the, the Bitcoin or whatever alternatives we, we can have in the future. Like, like Ron Paul, I'm still getting my own head around it. But I think there's just events like this just show you how fragile – these fiat currencies are. And what do you make of the future of the European or the just the euro, the actual currency that people are using? What What is the outlook for that? I mean, I know that some countries like Poland and great the United Kingdom have resisted. Uh, what uh, is that going to change any time in the future or are people trying to get out of it? Well, again, you, whether or not it's a good thing, you still have the Germans who are doing a great job of pumping it up right now. So, you know, is there a flight out? No. I mean, who do you have to compare it to? The U.S. dollar? That's the thing that people are talking about on the market is you don't really have a comparison. So I only see the European, uh, the euro getting stronger, unfortunately, until some sort of other competitive currency comes along. Icelandic leaders have been looking at the at the Canadian loonie. So I, the Canadian dollar is one of the most resilient around right now. Yeah, but I do have to say, Fergus, that our dollar, our Canadian dollar, still is pegged to the American currency. So it will never vary too much from that. So I watch sure. that. Gotcha. So back to my question, I was asking how how the Cyprus situation is affecting um, the the European continent. Is that having are, are there any ATM runs happening in other countries as a result of uh, what they're threatening to do in Cyprus? Well, I would be lying if I said uh, I did not go to the bank myself and withdraw a few uh, hundred euros. But well, uh, man. The- well, I would say that, yeah, there are, a, I mean, a lot of different people, and not really in Austria. Austria is a very stable country where they're not really scared about that, but definitely in places like Spain and Portugal. If you just look at the markets early this morning and you kind of read the stories, I read a little bit of the Spanish press, people are going to the ATMs just in droves. They're trying to get their money into liquid currency, get it now. I mean, we don't really know what's going to happen with Spain and Portugal coming up. These countries have already been bailed out, but they might need bailouts in the future. And I can pretty much imagine that the same is going on in Greece right now as well. Gotcha. Yeah, well, yeah we're going to have to wrap it up there. But, uh, folks, Yelisovsky, he's a rising journalist. I'm going to post that article below the, the link on the Stateless Man page. Uh, yeah, I look forward to being in touch and to, um, more, reading more of your great work. Okay. Thank you, Fergus, and thank you very much, Rachel. Thank you. Right on. Stay with us, folks. This is The Stateless Man. After the break, open borders and human trafficking. So a lot lot to to consider. This is The Stateless Man on ABC's Radio Network. Visit libertynexile.com.